Oh, that's cool. Itu bisa dikatakan sangat menjanjikan. Maksudnya sangat menjanjikan itu uh, satu potensi Bima sendiri di dalam bidang-bidang uh, kebahasaan atau pariwisata terutama sangat bagus di situ. Dan juga memang secara aturan dari pemerintah untuk PGSD sendiri sedang digalakkan ya karena kekurangan guru kita itu lumayan banyak. Data dari kata data kemarin itu qualified teachers itu less than 50% in each level gitu. Hmm. Iya, dan uh, mungkin hal yang perlu digarisbawahi juga uh, di universitas manapun itu di Indonesia jumlah dosen itu memang belum memenuhi kuota dari yang seharusnya. Iya, data-data dari kementerian juga uh, menyampaikan hal itu dari ikhtisar dari tahun ke tahun gitu. Akan tetapi ya. Uh, harus digarisbawahi ketika memang nantinya akan mengikatkan diri di salah satu universitas tersebut, tetap harus ada slot untuk melanjutkan studi lanjut terlebih yeah. dahulu atau mungkin uh, bisa mengajukan studi lanjut, uh, menyeles- mengajukan studi lanjut plus punya kelas online juga gitu. Jadi setelah berapa tahun kemudian setelah setelah apa namanya berada di tempat tersebut harus langsung lanjut karena hal tersebut wajib ya yes, saat begitu. ini ilmu yang Mbak dapatkan dari Monash kemungkinan besar bisa saja dipakai dalam prosentase yang cukup besar terutama ya. untuk um, apa ya curriculum construction kemudian untuk menentukan mata kuliah mata
Terus, terus, terus. terus. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Your Excellency, Mr. Sucipto, MPDBI, PhD, as the head of English Education Study Program, the Honorable Mr. Ivan Helmehapche, PhD, as our international guest lecturer today, 
the Honorable Ms. Ika Suciwati, and TESOL as today's moderator, the Honorable all of the lecturers of English Education Study Program, and unforgettable all of the participants of today's International Guest Lecture. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world, the King of the King, who makes all everything in this universe, who has given us blessings and mercies so that we can join this webinar section. And don't forget praying and greeting we send to our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who has brought us from the darkness to the path of the light. My name is Sanatul Alik Masmuni, as today's Master of Ceremony, and I would like to say welcome to International Guest Lecturer with the theme Current Studies in Translation Studies. Before going to our agenda today, let me read today's agenda. The first agenda is opening, second agenda is Megan main agenda, third is Q&A section, the fourth is hand over the certificate, and the fifth is passing, closing. Ladies and gentlemen, for the fifth agenda is opening. Let's open our agenda today by reciting Basmala together. The second agenda is what we are waiting for, the explanation from our guest lecturer, Mr. Ivan Redhel Mehabche, PhD. But before that, let me introduce our moderator for today's webinar to you. She is Ms. Ika, one of the alumnus of English Education Study Program of Universitas Ahmad Dan. She is a master's graduate of teaching English to speakers of other languages or TESOL from Monas University and was the Australian Award Scholarship or AAS. Currently, she is teaching in STKIP Taman Siswa in Bima. To Miss Ika, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Saniatul, for the opportunity. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I guess it's still afternoon time in Yogyakarta. I'm not sure in China or in Africa where Mr. Waifan is currently at. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable, our keynote speaker, Mr. Megabche. Um, also, the Honorable, all the lecturers of the English Education Department Study Pro Program of Ahmad Dalan University. Also, all the beloved participants uh, who have like spending time to attend this international lecture. Um, my name is Ika Suciwati. Once again, I just graduated from Master of TESOL from Ahmad, uh, sorry, from Monash University, Australia, not from Ahmad Dalan University. <laughs> uh, that was like my previous university. Um, so yeah, uh, today we will be proceeding to the international guest lecture in the current issues in translation studies with our keynote speaker all the way from China. But before that, I would like to read the curriculum um, VT of him, Mr. Megapche Waifan Prudel, PhD. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Did I pronounce it correctly, Mr. Waifan? Oh, actually, it's Ivan. It's Ivan, but it's okay. I, I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Ivan. It sounds like Indonesian name. Yeah, Mr. Ivan Rudel, PhD, or Mr. Megapche Wa Ivan Rudel, PhD, is a translator, lecturer, and researcher of linguistics and translation studies. So he is currently working in the School of Foreign Languages uh, in Hubei University of Automotive Technology, Xi'an, China. He is also a freelance translator with more than six years of experience and a member of the Association for Translation Studies in Africa. He is also an author of several articles. His research interest includes uh, cognitive linguistics, cultural linguistics, cross-cultural communication, metaphor and figurative language translation, translation competence, and audiovisual translation. Um, I would also like to tell you some previous uh, working history of Mr. Ivan. Um, he was a freelance, I think he is still is a freelance of translator um, as an security Yaoundé Cameroon from 2016 to uh, the present time. Also, 
translator for the best easy translation in Beijing, China, and currently taught undergraduate Chinese to English translation, undergraduate oral English, and master's English academic writing in Hubei University of Autonomy. China. Previously, he completed his Bachelor of Arts in Trilingual Studies Applied to Translation in Higher Institute of Translation Interpretations in Yaoundé, Cameroon in 2016. Also completed his Master's of Arts in Teaching Chinese to Speakers of Other Languages from Southwest University, Chongqing, China in 2018. And finally completed his PhD degree in Translation Studies from the same university, Southwest University. <laughs> so without further ado, I would like to start with our Mr. Ivan, the time is yours. Uh, all right. Uh, can you hear me? Can I be heard clearly? Yes, yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation, introduction. Uh, actually, I'm much more flattered. <laughs> I, yeah, so distinguished distinguished teachers, dear uh, students, um, it's my pleasure to be uh, here to e-meet you for this lecture on current issues in translation studies. So as said by the, by the moderator, I am uh, Dr. Megapche Megapche Ivan Ridal. Uh, um, I come from Cameroon, actually I'm from Cameroon, Central Africa, and uh, I've been in, but I've been living in China since 2016, where I studied my master's degree in teaching Chinese as a foreign language or uh, to speakers to, of other languages, and did my master's in, uh, in translation studies. So yeah, Let's now dive in into uh, our topic. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it clearly. Okay. So yeah, as you can notice, um, here is my university's name, Hubei University of Automotive Technology. It's located in Hubei province in Xi'an city. Uh, actually, I know much, many of you may not know where, uh, where Xi'an yeah. is located, but to put it simple, uh, I will just say um, it's two hours away from Wuhan. For those, uh, if you are familiar with, with COVID-19, you will definitely know <laughs> where Wuhan is. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so today my uh, my speech will be on current issues in translation studies, and it will unfold as follows. So uh, today we are going to tackle this topic from four main angles. Uh, the first one is defining what is translation, because I think the we can't talk about translation studies without defining what translation is. So after defining translation, then I'm going to give a brief introduction of what translation studies is. And uh, the third point will be the, the, main, the main point of this discussion which is uh, current issues in translation studies. And uh, at last, I will talk about AI and translation because um, I think also that it will be almost incomplete to talk about translation today, nowadays, uh, without uh, including AI because now AI is a core element, a core element of translation studies. So yeah, at last we are going to have, um, yeah, talk about, discuss about AI and translation and see how AI can be applied in translation studies, in translation activity and studies. 
and also uh, what are its advantages and uh, disadvantages of course because yeah it offers a lot of benefits but it also uh, has a lot of challenges so um now let me introduce uh what translation is um yeah so i right now i'm going to start so in case uh maybe i am not audible kindly notify me um sure i will always be here to assist the international guest lecture mr ivan don't worry about that yeah okay sure 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 so um the process of translation studies uh, of translation sorry the process of translation be uh, between two different written languages involves the changing of an original written text which we will usually call the source text or um use st the abbreviation st source text so it's the changing of an original written text in the original verbal language which is usually called source language sl into a written text the written text the this written text is usually called the target text target text or tt yeah target text in a different verbal language called the target language so to put it simple translating is moving from an original source text into a different target text so that's put simple as you can see here we move from the source text which is in the source language to a target text which is in a target language so for example translating a, pro a product manual from bahasa into english uh, when you do this type of translation, um, Bahasa will now be will be considered the source text. Yeah, the source text will be in Bahasa, and the target text will be English. So, then now that being said, according to uh, Roman Jacobson, a uh, famous linguist, there are three are types or categories i will even say categories there are three categories of translation the first one the first one is intralingual translation intralingual translation or rewarding what do we mean by intralingual translation by intralingual translation we mean the interpretation of verbal signs by means of another verbal uh, another signs of the same language for example uh let's imagine like almost all languages have uh in almost all languages we have the ancient language and the modern language so or the, con the, uh, the ancient language and the contemporary language. So for example, uh, we can have some texts uh, written by Shakespeare. As you all know, uh, the language or the English Shakespeare was using then is not the same that we are using right now. So if we, are, if we try to rewrite Shakespeare's in contemporary English or modern English, we are doing an intra lingual translation all right so we this term can be divided into two intra which means uh inside yeah internal and lingual which is language so we are translating within the same language same if you are translating uh, a text from an academic version to a more to a more popular version you are still doing an intralingual translation all right then the second category of translation is called interlingual translation which is a type of translation that many of us know right moving from one language to the other that's interlingual translation and um, translation scholars usually talk about this as translation proper so right we are doing translation uh, per se. So it's an interpretation of verbal signs by means of some other language. So you translate 
from Chinese into English. You are doing interlingual translation. You translate from Japanese into French. You are doing an interlingual translation. Now, the last category of translation is intersemiotic, intersemiotic translation. For those who are familiar with linguistics, they will know what semiotic means. Semiotic is um, semiotics is the science of signs, right? Science of signs. So when we say intersemiotic, we are moving from one sign system to another, right? So that we have the verbal sign system and we have the non-verbal sign system. Now. The translation, or uh, the intersemiotic translation, which is also called transmutation, is a translation that occurs in uh, situations such as translating from verbal language to sign language. Right? These are this is called this is a type of intersemiotic translation. Also, uh, when you watch, especially for those who are uh, for the for the blinds for the blinds when you have audio description right sometimes some images images are translated right because they cannot the uh, blind people cannot uh, they can't know they cannot notice when an image is displayed in a movie so there's there's a need of doing an audio description and this audio description will now be considered as an intersemiotic translation Okay, so now we finish introducing, uh, we finish introducing translation. That's the introduction of translation we just saw. Now uh, we are going to talk about translation studies because I, uh, actually there's a slight difference between translation as an activity and translation studies. So um, James Hull Holmes in 1988 uh, defined um, translation studies uh, also called translatology right some people say translatology others say translation studies but actually they have the same meaning it just depends on the terminology you would like to use uh, so he defined translation studies uh, or translatology as a discipline that deals with the complex of problems clustered around the phenomenon of translating and translating. So from this definition, we can see that translation studies deals with the activity of translating, right? And the translations that are already performed so it deal it deals with studies related to the process of translation and studies related with the products of translation so from this uh, from the definition we already have two core elements the process and the product so there are four very visible ways in which translation studies has become more prominent. The first one is the vast expansion in specialized translating and interpreting programs at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. So um, with the world uh, developing, evolving, there was a need, right? There was a need for her for um, cultures, for countries to collaborate. There was a need for countries to, to engage in uh, bilateral or multilateral uh, cooperation. So this couldn't be done if there's no translation. So uh, this particular point, people had to study translation because translation is not just trans uh, moving from one language to another. But it's uh, it's a profession. Right? It's a profession, and every profession needs to be learned. So that's the first um, 
the first thing that uh, made translation studies become uh, more prominent. No. The second one. No, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, the second one is the proliferation of conferences, books, and journals on translation in many languages. So when people, when more and more people started uh, being interested in translating, uh, definitely they have to meet each other, right? They meet each other at conferences. They have to write books that will be used by uh, teachers and students. And they also have to write uh, journal articles so that we can be aware of the state of the art of translation, right? So um, in this regard, we had, uh, we had longer standing international translation studies journals such as Babel, Babel uh, and Meta that were um, established in 1955. Uh, uh, Babel is from the Netherlands and um, Meta from Canada. We also have TTR, tradu uh, Traduction, this is in French, Traduction, Terminologie, Rédaction, from Canada, established in 1988. We have Target, also from the Netherlands, established in 1989. We have Perspectives, um, from Denmark in 1993, and the translator UK uh, in 1995 and these are just some right these are just some of the most prominent journals in the translation field we just uh, i just listed the the ones the early ones early ones the third the third um uh, the third thing that made translation studies more uh, more prominent is the increasing demand for general and analytical instruments such as anthologies databases encyclopedias handbooks and introductory texts as i said earlier um when people uh, get interested in a field definitely it should be, um, it has to adopt a scientific, scientific approach. And having a scientific approach means uh, putting in place uh, things like uh, anthologies, databases, encyclopedias, handbooks, and introductory texts, and many other types of texts. The last thing is international organizations. International organizations also have fostered uh, the prominence of translation studies. And one of, uh, some of the most um, famous international organizations uh, when it comes to translation is uh, Fédération Internationale des Traducteurs, International Federation of Translators, FIT. We also have the Canadian Association for Translation Studies uh, in French, Association Canadienne de Traductologie. Uh, that was founded in Ottawa in 1987. We also have the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies. And the last one is um, the Asia-Pacific Forum on Translation and Intercultural Studies, established in Guangzhou, uh, Jinghua. Hangzhou, sorry. Hangzhou uh, and Jinghua, between Hangzhou and Jinghua. So now uh, I borrowed uh, this um, uh, home, home's map, uh, home's map of translation studies uh, cited in Touris 1995. So uh, as you can see here, translation studies is divided into two main uh, categories. The first one is pure, pure translation studies. The other, the other one is applied translation studies. Then in pure translation studies, we have theoretical and descriptive translation studies. 
And within theoretical uh, translation studies, there's uh, what we call a general general translation studies, which is just like a general approach to um, translation studies. And then we have partial, partial translation studies. And uh, we, within partial translation studies, we can say we have medium restrict, restricted theories, area restricted theories, rank restricted theories, text type restricted theories, time restricted theories, and problem restricted theories. Then the descriptive approach to translation studies has uh, three main approaches, right? There are product-oriented, process-oriented, function and function-oriented. And in applied translation studies, from applied translation study, you didn't understand that all the, uh, we apply the studies that have been done in translation and we do translation as we are mostly looking at tra as translation from the translator training, translator training, translation aids and translation criticism. So then what does this mean? Pro product oriented uh, descriptive translation uh, studies examines existing translations. So this approach to translation studies uh, deals with translations that are already done, right? translations that are already done. Uh, for example, um, I guess Indonesia is mostly uh, a Muslim country, so you deal a lot with the translation of the Quran. So a product-oriented translation could be uh, uh, a study the product oriented descriptive translation studies can be um, the study of the various translations of the Quran. So, I guess the version that probably you are using now, I'm not a Muslim, I don't know much, but I think if it's almost like the Bible, then there should be uh, many versions from the first translated version till now, right? So, they can be, it can be um, a study. Uh, in, uh, it can be an investigation of the translations of the Quran from Arabic into Bahasa, right? The various translations that exist. So, uh, yeah, then we have the function oriented descriptive uh, translation studies. These uh, types of studies means the, the description of the function of translations in the recipient's social cultural situation. It is a study of context rather than text, right? So this type of uh, this type of study uh, focus on the function that the translation will have in the target context or the target culture, right? Because uh, if you remember, I just said translation is more than moving from one language to uh, another it, but uh, it's rather um moving from one culture to the other to another so um yeah so here we focus on the the function what is the function of the text the last type of um, of uh, descriptive translation studies is process oriented studies. Process oriented studies um, are concerned with the psychology of translation. For example, it is concerned with trying to find out what happens in the mind of a translator. We are going to see this. Um, uh, later in the current issues in translation the process oriented are not the end they do not deal neither they don't deal neither with the product nor the function of the translation but they deal with the process what happens in the mind for example why would a translator choose to use the uh, one translation strategies instead of another so this is what they will 
mostly studied. So this is a mixture of psycholinguistics and cognitive science. Psycholinguistics and uh, cognitive science, cognitive linguistics. Now we jump into the partial uh, translation studies. Partial translation studies has six uh, different types of studies. The first one is medium restricted uh, theories, uh, which is subdivide, uh, subdivided according to translation by machine and um, humans with further subdivisions according to whether the machine computer is the machine or computer is working alone automatic translation or as an aid to human translator to the human translator a computer assisted translation what we also call a cat computer assisted translation to whether the human translation is written or spoken and to whether spoken translation interpreting is consecutive or simultaneous. So here we are mostly considered of the medium, how the translation is done, right? How is the translation done? Then area restricted theories are restricted to specific languages or groups of languages or cultures. Holmes notes that language restricted theories, example, um, Javanese, English, pair, are closely related to work in contrastive linguistics and stylistics. So in area restricted theories, there's usually a kind of contrastive analysis of uh, a language pair, right? A language, a uh, language combination. We, for example, will see how would Indonesians translate, um, for example, love in English, right? How would the love word, uh, the the love uh, word in Indonesia in Indonesian, would be translated into English, for example? All right, so this can be an area restricted study. Then the rank restricted theories are rank restricted theories are linguistic uh, linguistic theories that have been restricted to a level or of the word or sentence. All right, you can just try to um you can decide to to limit your studies to a word, right? Like last time, and I'm probably going to introduce it to you. Uh, there was, there's a research which is done on the translation of the expression, I'm loving it in Polish language, for example. So they would just use this sentence to make a translation uh, study. Then the text type restricted theories look at discourse types right discourse types i think for you, for those majoring in english you might have heard of discourse analysis right discourse there are different types of discourses there are many types of discourses for example the literary business and technical translation so the text type uh, transition for example we have uh, if you like the way you would translate um you will translate um, a literary text will be different from uh, the translation of a political text, right? So some people will study the translation of a literary text. Others will be focused on legal translation, uh, political translation, public public speech translation, and many other types of um, discourse. And we also have uh, time-restricted uh, theories. Time-restricted theories uh, refer to uh, theories and translations limited according to specific time frames and periods. This is where you will see um, what we call translation history, right? So you can decide to translate 
uh, make a study on the translation of texts uh, within uh, maybe the colonial period, right? How were texts translated within uh, during the the colonial period, right? That can be a time restricted approach to translation. Then the problem restricted approach to translation refers to um, certain problems such as equivalence, right? This has been all, this has always been an issue. And if I remember clearly when on your Instagram page, I, uh, I noticed that you will have another lecture uh, related to uh, the challenges, something like that, the challenges faced in translation. So I guess the, um, the speaker will be introducing this from the perspective of a problem restricted uh, researches uh, on translation. So a problem restricted uh, uh, study of translation is just about investigating on a specific aspect of translation that uh, of translation that might cause a lot of problem either to the translators or to the receivers, right? Those who are going to read or, or listen to your translation. Then the last thing uh, concerning translation studies is applied translation studies. So how can we, there are many ways of uh, doing applied translation studies. The first one is translator training. So here we are going to focus on teaching methods. Right? How can we improve our teaching methods to uh, better our translator's training? We are going also to have testing techniques. Right? We can put in place some techniques and try to, to apply them and see uh, whether they work or not. Or we can also do uh, cur curriculum design, right? We can try to design what will be the best uh, courses or the best syllabus for translation uh, students. And we also have translation aids. We have uh, such as dictionaries and grammar. So they are translation studies scholars uh, that will only focus on elaborating and establishing dictionaries uh, or encyc encyclopedias and may or many other things, glossaries related to, to a specific field of translation. That's why you will see you will have a glossary in, uh, in political trans uh, in political translation between one language and another. You will have a, a glossary of medical translation, a glossary of uh, um, legal translation, and many other types of translation. Then the last one is translation criticism, which includes, um, uh, which talks about uh, evaluation, the evaluation of translations, including the marking of student of student translations and the reviews of published translations. So one thing is marking student translations. So you will uh, evaluate how do, uh, does your student, how do your students, sorry, how do your student uh, translate? Uh, what are the translation strategies they are using? What are the difficulties they are facing and how can you overcome them? And also we can make a uh, appraisal of um, translations that already exist, right? And uh, uh, from the criticism uh, perspective, uh, so you can e try to evaluate uh, according to you, how is this translation done and what are the shortcomings of this translation and uh, what are its strengths? So yeah, this is, these are also some studies you can do in uh, translation studies. Okay, so uh, that being said, now we have, we can see, uh, we are going to see some approaches, uh, I mean, theoretical approaches to translation.
because uh, you might know, and for those who do, do not know, translation is, uh, the particularity of translation is that it is a kind of interdisciplinary uh, field of study, right? It's always, it's usually applied with some linguistic, uh, uh, linguistic approaches. And when I say linguistic here, I mean linguistic as a field, right? Because right now we are going to see that within linguistic, there are also various types of linguistics. So um, the first one is um, linguistic approaches. So when the field of translation studies were, was, we, could, we can say was born, uh, one of the first approach uh, of the first approaches is um, was comparative linguistic analysis, uh, mainly done by Vinay and Da uh, Da Comparative linguistic analysis. So it was mostly consisting of taking one language and seeing uh, their similarities and their differences and making some conclusions, right? For, uh, for example, we would, we would make a comparative, uh, linguistic, ana comparative linguistic analysis of uh, um, French and English, right? And see the, uh, how the, uh, their syntaxes are formed, how they are the words are formed and and so on. Then Roman Jacobson came with a structural approach, right? And the uh, types of translation and and the equivalent, the issue of equivalence. George Munan came with a linguistic view of translation, and here we were mostly talking about prescriptive views of translation. So they were prescribing how translation should be should be done. Then neither then neither uh, came with applied uh, he applied Chomsky's translational generative grammar and the formal and dynamic equivalents. So he came by applying Chomsky's uh, generative translational generative grammar. He put in place a uh, formal and dynamic equivalence. And the last one in this approach is John Cartford, who applied uh, Halliday systemic functional grammar to talk about formal correspondence and textual equivalent, uh, textual equivalence and um, uh, translation. <laughs> We also have uh, text and discourse analysis approaches uh, brought by uh, Mona Mona Baker. Brought by Mona Baker. Um, the notion uh, here she was talking about the notion of equivalence in lines of Halliday functional uh, grammar. So you can see that uh, Halliday's uh, linguistic has uh, contributed a lot to translation study. And we also have House uh, who talked about translation quality and assessment also based on Halliday's system systemic functional grammar. And um, uh, Basil Hattim and Mason who uh, most talked about uh, the additional and interpersonal levels of meaning. So this was for the text and discourse analysis uh, approaches. Functional approaches are most, mostly focused on text type, text type approach. The text type approach, for example, uh, we have Carl uh, Buller's categorization of text. So what is the function? You remember, I, I was talking about a function. What is the function of the text? Is the, uh, is the text informative, expressive, or operative, right? So it's usually according to that, that we perform our translation. 
So the way you perform an informative text will not be the way you perform an expressive text. Then Christian Nord came with a textual function approach to translation, quite similar to Catherine Rice. Uh, Snell Hornby came uh, with the um, integrated approach, still based on text type, uh, drawing the notion of prototype. And the last one, Hans Vermeer, is, came with the scopal theory. I guess some of you have already heard about scopal theory. Uh, the scopal theory, uh, in a nutshell, is just a theory that's focused on the purpose, the aim of a translation. The last uh, approach the, uh, uh, that is going to be discussed uh, in this part is the social cultural, social cultural approach. So here we come now to the ideology and power of translation. So now translation becomes uh, a matter of ideology and power. So that's why you will see that during wars, translators are, are usually uh, protected because uh, when it, at this particular time, um, translation has a uh, very strong power. And also right now we are facing an, an issue between Israel and uh, the and Palestine. You will definitely agree with me that uh, a translator uh, either from Israel or Palestine, translating a text related to this war will have uh, an ideal, they will have different ideologies, right? And their translation will be, will receive some impact. So in social cultural approaches, yeah, we do uh, relate uh, such um, studies to see how translation can impact uh, the political life or the call, uh, the the social life of a country. We have also Anton Berman with naturalization, and negative and positive analytics, and the last one Lawrence Venuti, who came with domestication and foreignization uh, and the translators invis uh, invisibility. So domestication is uh, just um. Uh, trying to domesticate a term. So, for example, um, uh, I have a proverb or maybe a saying such as like father, like son, for example, right? Probably in Bahasa, uh, if I want to translate this same expression, I uh, saying like father, like son, literally, will not be uh, authentic. So, I will look for an authentic saying that will mean the same thing so then i will, would have been uh i would be doing a domestication then for organization is uh, is part of uh like uh, we have example in foreignization we may have examples such as um, the borrowings right uh we can say uh covid19 for example has entered has been foreignized in many of our languages right it wasn't existing, but we foreignized it, foreignized it in our languages. Right now, in all languages, you have uh, COVID-19. So that was all for uh, introduction to uh, translation study. Right now, we are going to dive into uh, current issues in translation studies. So here, According to my understanding and the way I prepared this uh, this lecture, I limited uh, myself to the types of studies that are currently done in translation studies. Right? The types of studies that are currently done in translation studies. The first one, which is uh, something uh, that is still, uh, that has been and is still a hot topic uh, in the area of translation studies is audiovisual translation 
uh, audiovisual translation. So, um, according to Rimael and Diasintas, although audiovisual translation is um, a relatively new area in translation study, it, uh, it has become one of the most significant and fast developing areas of, of this field, or field of translation. Uh, moreover, it um, at the early stage of ABT, uh, audiovisual translation, uh, at the early stages, audiovisual translation uh, was most commonly known as film translation. The main reason of, uh, of its quick rise is that uh, audiovisual translation uh, uh, was had a number had a number of publications uh, in the field and shown uh, and there was a lot of interest shown by scholars so more and more people more and more people got interested in learning uh, audiovisual translation that's why now it has become a hot topic and uh, research in audiovisual uh, translation uh, in audiovisual research uh, of, uh, in translation includes subtitle translation. I guess all of us here are uh, familiar with subtitle translation. Uh, we also have dubbing, uh, voiceover, and audio description, uh, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah, your audio description is just an audio um, respeaking, audio respeaking of what is said uh, of maybe what cannot be seen, right? What cannot be seen in a movie. So uh, now I'm going to give you some examples of researches that can be done within this area of, of translation studies. For example, here we have some topics uh, in the current issues of uh, target. Target, I, if you remember, I mentioned this um, journal in the introduction, introduction of uh, translation studies. So here, for example, we have translation and streaming in a changing world. Translation and streaming. When you hear streaming, you already know that we are either talking about um, videos or, yeah, or visual content, um, social networks, right? Social, it can be uh, Facebook, it can be YouTube, it can be uh, any other platform. Like in China, we have uh, Bilibili, uh, we have... Uh, TikTok or uh, uh, Douyin, Douyin. Yeah, you have TikTok. We have Douyin. Yeah. So translation and streaming, you know, changing world. Another one can be um the audience. Uh, okay, the title here is the audience tries back. But here, as you can see, this can be um uh, a criticism, right? A criticism of subtitles, right? We go in cinema, movies, or we watch online, we watch movies online, and probably we are not satisfied by the dubbing or the subtitle translations or the audio description. So some scholars will be interested in doing such researches, right? They will try to get uh, insights from the audience. Because we should not uh, forget when we translate, it's for a specific audience. We translate for a specific audience. So sometimes to better our translations, we also need to uh, hear from them. Yeah? What do they think about our translations? Are they satisfied? If yes, good. If they are not, what are their suggestions? What do they think? Another topic is here. Here is uh, bilingual subtitling in streaming media, right? So you can see that 
streaming researchers on translation from a streaming perspective is quite uh, a current issue in translation. All right. So for some of our fellow uh, students here, from our students here who are probably preparing to do translation or preparing for their thesis, right? Uh, if you plan to write on translation, you might be interested in writing uh, on audiovisual translation. Another uh, topic would be translating intercultural interactions. Translating intercultural interaction in the Netflix branded film, American Factory, right? So now we've moved, we've moved to um, online, uh, like we were already seeing here, streaming, right? Netflix is also a streaming platform, right? So you can choose a movie and do uh, related uh, studies. Uh, boys in the band. Uh, okay, this, this this is not very obvious from the title. It's not very obvious. Here, for example, subtitlers beliefs about pivot templates. Right. Um, here will be for those who are doing a little bit of subtitling. For those who are already doing uh, subtitling. They will be probably more familiar with this question. And uh, another one, disruptive audiovisual translation workflows in the age of streaming. So, as you can see, in the previous topics, we are mostly uh, here, they are mostly focused on the products, right? The products. Though here, when we say workflows, we are mostly focused on the translator it's itself, himself. We are mostly focused on the translator himself. Um, the workflow. So in the age of streaming, you all know that uh, since we have many streaming platforms right now, uh, there are many movies to translate. So how is the workflow? Are, um, are translators coping with the workflow uh, or not? So this can also be um, an interesting interesting uh, research to carry, carry out. And uh, we now also have cognitive translation. Cognitive translation goes back to what I mentioned earlier. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier. Um, cognitive approaches to translation endeavors uh, to describe the cognitive processes of translation. Besides uh, being valuable uh, to see how translators perform translation processes, it likewise has significant pedagogical ramifications, right? So here, we analyze the process of translation to make recommendations, right? To make recommendations that will serve as pedagogical um, uh, pedagogical suggestions, right? If we can identify what translators uh, go through during the process of translation, we will be able to uh, adjust our pedagogical strategies, right? So by demonstrate, so this uh, type of, tra of translation study will demonstrate uh, which are the translation processes that need higher cognitive efforts? This theory of translation stresses more on the translation process, which are likely to get more practical training in the teaching curriculum. So, for example, uh, in this type of study, we have the study of metaphor, the translation of metaphor and metonymy. And as you all know, um, metaphor. Metaphors and metonymies are quite difficult uh, aspect of languages uh, to, to to translate, right? Because they are culturally embedded, right? Uh, there, I've done some studies on metaphor translation, and I can assure you that there are some metaphors that exist in Indonesia or in Indonesia, uh, but 
do not exist in English or in French or in Chinese, right? So metaphor and metonymies are culturally uh, embedded, which means that during their translation from one language to another, the translation may face a lot of difficulties. So we can now use cognitive translation studies to identify what is the translation process? What happens in the mind of the translator, right? What are the cognitive efforts? What are the cognitive efforts? When translating metaphor, do, uh, does the, the translator face, uh, have to furnish more efforts, more cognitive efforts than when he translates uh, normal uh, or regular words? So these are, types of, uh, these are studies that can be done in translation, uh, cognitive translation. So, in cognitive translation, we have cognitive linguistics um, trans and translation studies, and we have what we call cognition and translation. So, cognition and translation studies will mostly include um, um, cognitive science, right? It will be mostly based on psychology, right? Psychology and translation, psych uh, psycholinguistics and translation. So the first one, the first approach in cognitive translation, which is a kind of light approach or uh, light cognitive approach to translation, will deal of with aspects. Here, for example, you have um, uh, a book that was uh, written for, by uh, Anna Rojo and Ibarretse and Tuniano. Uh, pronunciation is quite difficult, but yeah. So it's it's uh, as you can see here. For example, it, it discusses um, the interface between cognitive linguistics and cognitive translation. Uh, uh, we uh, okay. Let's call, let's go down here. For example, frame semantics, right? Frame semantics and translation the impact of cognitive linguistics on descriptive translation studies, right? Novel metaphors. Novel metaphors in English and Spanish newspaper, right? So how are novel metaphors translated from English into Spanish newspapers? Newspaper, right? So, yeah. And also here you have grammar, cognitive grammar in translation. And now this approach you see on my screen here is um, cognitive science, cognitive science, which is closely related to psychology, right? The psychology approaches to translation studies. So we can see here we have uh, Paper written by uh, Zhi, uh, Yang Yang Zhihong and uh, Li Dofeng. Uh, Li Dofeng is a professor in, in um, uh, Macau Macau uh, University. So they investigate translation competence, right? translation competence towards a pedagogical model of translation competence. So you can use cognitive science to see the process of translation and use the, the result to adapt it to uh to how to to how to cultivate how to cultivate translation competence right because translation competence is a mixture of many other competences then effort models and interpreting as a didactic construct Eye tracking, okay. Eye tracking is uh, is a is a methodology usually used in uh, in psychology. So they will use eye trackers to see during a translation where which are the words where the translation uh, pays more attention to, right? From that they can they can conclude that probably this is very difficult for the translator to translate. The translator is taking much time 
to, to translate this particular word. And it can help adjusting the translation, the translation uh, training. The next one is a translation history. Translation history. Translation history uh, is the study of translation from historical perspectives. Uh, I mentioned that when I was explaining time restricted theories. Time restricted theories. So historical perspectives have always played an important part in translation studies. But it was only around the beginning of the 21st century, which means very recent, right? Of the 21st century that uh, translation history began to emerge as a specific field, one with its own developing methodology and meta discourse and its own identifiable body of research that we might describe as the emergence of histo uh, historiography of translation and interpreting. Translation history studies include for the following research. So uh, either chronological research, right? You do uh, research in a chronological order or diachronic research. Diachronic research is a research from different uh time spans right you may decide to 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 uh, do some research uh between probably 1984 to 19 uh 1989 then from 2000 to 2010 that's what we call a diachronic research so here are some examples of um researchers that are carried out in uh, translation history research first topic here for example is um feminists of all languages unite translation as political practice in the 1970s or a historical view of feminist translation this uh, is an interesting topic, especially that feminist translation has also been a trend recently. Translating the classics, right? You can decide to translate uh, classics from English, right? Translating that you can decide to examine the translation of Shakespeare's, right? Probably Shakespeare's has been translated. I would take a, a random example, translated uh, in 1984, then in 1995, then in 2010. So you can make a diachronic, a diachronic uh, research of Shakespeare's translations, right? Uh, soldiers, interpret interpreters, fixers, and spies. A Finnish military interpreter embodying the Finnish German Brotherhood in arms in 1941 to 1944. So this is a chronological, chronological research, right? From 19 uh, from 1941 to 1944. Uh, we have translation and transnational history in the 18th century. Travel, writing, and translation history. Researching the history of audiovisual translation. So you see that that's, this is why translation studies is quite an interesting field of studies because um, we can apply various, various, uh, we can carry out various research. So you apply translation history to Trans audiovisual translation. So it means that by doing this type of research, you are doing translation history and audiovisual translation somehow. Then the last one, the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation, translation policies in interwar period from 1925 to 1946. So this is what uh, we mean by 
uh, doing trans. Uh, this is a, these are the types of researches you can make within the uh, area of translation history, and these are just some. Right, there are many other types of uh, researches that can be done within uh, this uh, area. Okay, so um, uh, what if we give a five minute break to our students so that they can either go to the bathroom or drink some water? Yep, Ms. Yep, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, short break. Also for you, Mr. Ivan, uh, for five <laughs> minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, thank uh, you. Actually, there's like a simple request from some of the participants about the PowerPoint yeah. that you are currently using. Can we actually yeah. like have a copy of it after the talk? Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, so two dear participants will be having a very short break, about like uh, four to five minutes. So for everyone, if you would like to have like coffee or some snacks or go running to the toilet, just please do so uh, at this moment, because after uh, this short break, we will continue to the next uh, PowerPoint slides. Mr. Ivan will talk more about translation studies also, I'm very interested to know about like the AI or the artificial intelligence in the translation studies okay. after this. Um, um, also yeah. the question and question and, and, and questions. So yeah, please go to the bathroom or anything else that you would like. Um, I would also like to remind to all of the participants to um, prepare your questions because shortly we will continue to like some other slides, but I guess it's not going it's not going to be like too long because Mr. Ivan has like talked briefly uh, about like a lot of things already. He already covered a lot of issues. Um, so during the question and answer session, I would like to hear uh, perhaps your question on the chat or or directly raise your hand um, and we will discuss uh, more on the issue. All right, so another reminder for the participants other than to prepare your question, uh, we will actually, we will also send a uh, attendance list for you to fill in later uh, during the question and answer session. So after filling in the attendance list, you will be on the list for 
receiving the e-certificate from the committee so please get ready for that because it is an international like guest lecture something uh, on the certificate so please looking forward to that all right oh, so um, I guess uh, yeah i'm here at any time when we need to start just let me know yeah, yeah. So you can start each time. Yeah. Okay. And I think you still have like around 10 minutes to present your ideas. Is that enough, Mr. Ivan? Uh I think so, but I think I should be closer to that. So yeah. yeah I will try no worries. to Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um so let me proceed. Yes, All also right, so, the PowerPoint, we haven't seen your PowerPoint yet. Oh, my PowerPoint is not, you can't see my PowerPoint? Uh, I mean, like, it's not shared yet. Would you mind to re reshare it on the, on the slide, on the okay. desktop? Can you see it now? Oh, wait, let me see. Uh, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, before uh, the break, uh, this, yeah, I think before the break, this is why I stopped. So um, now, I will also like to introduce uh, you to cognitive um, linguistics and translation. So this is a kind. This is a kind of in interdisciplinary uh, research that is currently done in in translation studies. Uh, um, in the beginning, I don't know for those who came early uh, when I was discussing with uh, Dr. Rifki. Yeah. I was telling her that I was in Chongqing recently for a conference, and actually I was there to attend an international conference on on cultural linguistics. And uh, I can assure you that this is a very, very interesting approach that you can apply, and that is even currently applied in, in, in translation studies. Uh, because now uh, I can say that linguistically speaking, Everything has already been done in translation studies. So now we are at the era of uh, cultural exchange, right? By the era of cultural exchange, and now uh, the 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 research, the research uh, interest has shifted. The research uh, research uh, the research interest has shifted to cultural aspects of languages. So cultural linguistics. There's an area of linguistic that uh, sees uh, language as a cultural form and that has a, a conceptualizations underlying uh, that have on, uh, conceptualization underlying the language. And also uh, they say that culture is what forms um, Language, sorry, language is what forms a cultural system. So they are interdependent. They are interdependent. So um, studies uh, done in this area compare two or more languages and cultures through the prism of translation studies. So we compare languages uh, and cultures within translation studies. So cultural linguistics and translation studies include uh, research related to irony translation, right? Uh, I guess um, you have already heard about irony translation, but uh, using cultural linguistics, there are so many things that can uh, still be discovered in, in translation. And we also have the translation of humor, right? Um, it goes without saying that uh, when we watch a movie, when you watch a movie, for example, in English, and there are jokes, uh, 
uh, sometimes if you listen to uh, maybe the the Bahasa version, you'll feel that if if it's still funny, it's either that either the two languages share the same type of joke or the translation has adopted a joke that is uh, understandable by uh, Bahasa speakers. So, Bahasa. Uh, which means that which means that humor is a cultural thing. Humor is a cultural thing. That's why sometimes what makes a Chinese uh, laugh will not make an Indonesian laugh, right? Because you know, do not share the same humor or uh, humor culture, humoristic culture. And also within this field, we also have metaphor translation. But here, uh, unless like in cognitive uh, linguistics, these metaphors are cultural metaphors, right? We'll, they focus on metaphors that only exist, exist within a culture, right? Within a culture. So here we have few examples. Here we have few examples of uh, some topics falling uh, within uh, these types of, uh, of research. Uh, we have uh, primary and secondary translations and they are cultural implications. Primary and secondary translations and they are cultural implications. Then the Bible translation in Broglio, Welcome to the gap. Cultural gap, right? Cultural gap of translation at the age of new media. Cycles of, oh, okay, this could be quite challenging if we have a uh, non uh, non translation major student. Um, here, for example, yeah. Grammar translation into Arabic. Shakespeare's Macbeth issues and solutions. So, what are the cultural issues that can uh, that the the translator can face when translating, right? And what are the solutions we can uh, suggest? Uh, yeah. So they are quite here. For example, metaphors as an intercultural bridge for educational enterprises. Enterprise. Integrating cultural conceptualization, cultural conceptualization. So, according to cultural linguistics, uh, there are many types of cultural uh, conceptualization. We have uh, there are many categories. There are cultural metaphors, cultural schemas, and cultural categories. Uh, yeah. So, how does Polish sign language affect the way in which deaf holes write in Polish. So there are many uh, there are many studies you can do in this. So here I got for you uh, two abstracts. Uh, during the introduction of this uh, lecture, I talked about the translation of "I'm loving it." So here is a a research that was done um, in Poland by Walensky. So the title is Cross-Cultural Reconceptualization as a Key Part of Translation Competence Development, a case study of I'm Loving It. So they only res make research on this earth and they use cultural linguistics. Why do they use cultural linguistics? Because um, the the way translators uh, translate, even if they are all from the same cultural background, they if they are from the same country, sorry, they have different cultural backgrounds. Right? For example, uh, uh, in in Indonesia, there are many uh, I can say tribes of et or ethnic groups. They are you are all Indonesian, but when if you are given a translation to uh, if you are given a translation we will find some specificities in your translations why because you do not share the same cultural background right 
So uh, culture it has a very uh, huge impact on the translation. So in this research, the person used the researcher used forty five proposals. So he he, uh, he gave this sentence. I'm loving it to forty five students to translate. Then he analyzed the translation and drew and drew his conclusions. Right. And here we have another type of study that is done uh, within the canopy of uh, uh, cultural linguistics. It's applying cultural linguistics to translation studies, a new model for humor translation. Right? You can apply um, cultural linguistics to humor translation in some of maybe the most famous um most famous movies in Indonesia, most famous series in Indonesia, or probably most famous books in Indonesia. It's up to you how you feel it. And uh, now we talk about computer aided uh, technologies and translation. Technologies and translation. So computer aided translation, CET tools. Uh, and machine translation have revolutionized and continue to revolutionize the practice of translation, and they are altering both the perception of translation amongst users and the conceptualization of translation amongst producers and theorists. For the general user, automatic translation programs, whether online or on a smartphone, give the impression, uh, indeed even provide a reality, that translation is an instantaneous, instantaneous uh, activity. The quality they achieve can be quite high depending on jar conventions and language proximity. So now with our, uh, with machine translation uh, and our smartphones, we have the impression that every translation can be achieved, uh, which is not completely wrong, right? Uh, for a few years now, it's very uh, easy to achieve uh, a certain quality uh, of translation by simply doing a machine translation. So then the question becomes, do I pay for a slightly better human translation when I can get a reasonable for free, right? So there's now this problem. If I can if I uh, can achieve this translation with my phone, should I still pay someone to do this translation, right? Which means that the role of the translator will now shift, right? And we can anticipate that there will be a time uh, when the intervention of the human translator will be almost entirely centered on post editing and quality assuring right so if the translate if the machine can translate or a computer aided tools can translate a text for you so you as a translator what would you do now you can only do post editing which means that the translator is still needed the human translator is still needed because many at times um the machine translation does not take into account some social cultural elements right but it's now it's up to the translator to adjust the machine translator translation so yeah so in technologies and translation here are some of the current research uh, that are carried out. Uh, we have machine translation, post editing, right? Productivity, new, and then there are new payment methods, right? Because before translators were paid to do the whole job. So now probably they will be paid only to do um, post editing, which means that the cost will change. They may either increase or decrease, but they are likely to decrease. Automation strategies, 
Um, machine translation uh, usability, right? the user experience. Right? So there are other research who are focusing on how to improve the user uh, experience of machine translation. We also have concurrent translation using digital platform. Concurrent translation is um, a translation is, um, how can I put it? Concurrent translation means, uh, includes, is a type of collaborative translation on digital platforms. So different translators will be doing uh, the same translation uh, in the cloud, cloud platform, right? That's what we mean by concurrent translation. And translation process research, how do translators engage with online resources while they are translating? So how do they combine all these machine translation uh, into their translation? We also have corpus-based translation studies, digital lexicography and second language writing, analysis of big, language data to support human and automated translation. We also have human computer interaction, human computer interaction. How does you, how does uh, the human being interact with computer? Yeah? How user interfaces impact the work of translators and interpreters? How language impacts technology? So that's all for the current issues in translation studies. So right now I'm going to give you quick um, insight of AI and translation, which I think is also a current issue in, in translation. So the field, of, um, the field of translation has been significantly impacted by the rapid advancement of artificial in, uh, intelligence technology, technologies. AI-powered translation tools have transformed the way translations are conducted, making them faster, more e efficient, and ready, readily available. Machine translation systems such as Google Translate and DeepL utilize AI algorithms. Right? Then we have also uh, computer-assisted uh, translation. Uh, these tools include um, SDO Trados, SDO Trados, and uh, MemoQ, and other 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 platforms or soft and softwares, and uh, they employ AI-based features like memory. So, for example, with SDO Trados, uh, this uh, software keeps memory of the words and terminology that you use, right? Meaning that if if you save it, if you save a word or an expression, um, anytime you come across that same expression or word, your software will suggest, will make suggestions. So you don't need to, to translate them again. Right? So the benefits, the benefits of, uh, of AI in translation, they they have quite a, a huge amount of, of benefits, quite a huge amount of benefits. For example, AI tools such as ChatGPT and GPT-4 um, as emphasized in many uh, studies, have the ability to generate translations automatically and these translation, these translations similar to those provided by traditional machine translation systems can be regarded as translation drafts that provide users a useful starting point for translating a text. So when you do your translation, now nowadays, um, you can use ChatGPT, for example, to, as a starting point, right? As a starting point, you use uh, ChatGPT for for let's say for the draft translation, and then you as the human translator, you will do the post editing, proofreading to polish your 
the translation, right? So we can have here, as you can see here, we have uh, the user who gives the command to ChatGPT. Please suggest three ways to translate the following into English. And ChatGPT to suggest three ways of translating that passage. Chat uh, GPT-4 will do the same. Right, GPT-4 will do the same. AI can also uh, help to do a kind of quality assurance. Right? You remember we talked about quality assessment. Now with AI, we can also do a quality assurance in translations, right? which is quite interesting. Uh, it can help you detecting missing translations, mistranslated numbers, and grammatical lapses. Here is an example. We have the user giving the command, consider the following text and its English translation. Okay, in China, uh, here is uh, uh, Hong Kong population in 2018 was uh, 751 million. And in Chinese is Xiangang. 2018年人口一七七百五十一亿，哎，呃，七百五十一呃亿，yes. So, um, now the trans the uh, chat GPT and GPT four will help the translator or the user detect that there was an error here. In the source text, we have 2019, but in the target text, we have 2018. So chat GPT will say, the translated text states that Hong Kong's population was 751 million in 2018, which is incorrect as it is an order of magnitude higher than the actual figure, right? The translators, text uses the wrong year as it says 2000 and 2018 instead of 2019 right so now it will suggest a translation revised version it will suggest a revised version hong kong's population in 2019 was 7.5 7.51 million. So this is what AI can help you doing now. Another thing uh, uh, AI tools can help you do is provide suggestions to refine translations, improving their accuracy, clarity, and fluency. Right? So you can give the command to ChatGPT to explain the meaning of each su suggestion. Uh, I had a delicious meal at the restaurant and it will explain. It can also be used as a converse, uh, conversational mode in our tr translation. So the, translate, uh, the translator can converse with uh, Chat GPT and progressively, which can progressively enhance outputs through multi round dialogue, right? You can say, explain how to translate the above text. Then you can add the official English name of for the event should be, and Chat GPT or GPT 4 will do it for you. Now, although it has many benefits, uh, it also has um, many challenges. It also caused many problems. Why? Because now AI tools will make the translators uh, become overly reliant on machine translation systems, leading to a potential decrease in their language proficiency. Right? Translators or student translators will not care too much about improving their language proficiency because they know that um, AI tools will do the work for them. 
and it also have an impact on their critical thinking skills because they will think that whatever the AI uh, tools suggest are whatever it suggests, it's good, right? So this could be a challenge. The accuracy of machine translation outputs can vary depending on the language pair and complexity of the text, necessitating necessitating the translators to process the ability to identify and correct errors. Another one could be that teachers uh, face the challenge of striking a balance between AI into, uh, integration and maintaining a focus on linguistic and cultural competence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they must yeah. guide students in effectively utilizing utilizing AI tools while emphasizing the importance of human judgment and creativity in translation. So creativity in translation is still required. It's still required to make the difference between other types of translation. So with this new era, with AI, what are the skills and competencies that uh, our translators need now? They need linguistic and uh, linguistic and cultural uh, proficiency. Translators need to possess strong linguistic and cultural proficiency to ensure accurate and culturally appropriate translations. They should have a deep understanding of grammar, syntax, and vocabulary in both the source and target languages. And furthermore, they must be culturally aware Right, they should have cultural awareness and sensitivity. Uh, yeah, they should have cultural uh, awareness and sensitivity, right, to perform their translations, right, because they need some cultural references in both cultures. They also need adapt uh, adaptability and creativity, right? Translators must adapt to training technologies and possess the creativity to generate translations that are contextually appropriate, nuanced, and stylistically accurate. They need to go beyond literal translation and consider the target audience, purpose, and tone of the text. Then they all they equally need critical thinking and problem solving skills, right? Translator must, uh, translators must critically analyze, evaluate translations uh, produced by AI tools. We should not all be completely reliant on AI tools. We should have uh, problem solving uh, thinking and uh, critical thinking, identifying and rectifying inaccuracies and maintaining high quality standards standards. Then the last one, ethical consideration, which is which according to me is going to be a serious problem within the area not only of translation but in all aspects, even in research. Right? With AI it's now very, very easy to copy from others. Right? So the AI era raises ethical questions for translators. They must navigate issues such as privacy, data security, and intellectual property rights. Translators should adhere to professional ethics, ensuring transparency and accountability in their work. So you will be held accountable for any translation that you produce. So meaning that you have need to have the best working ethics. So that will be all for me. Uh, your questions are mostly welcome. These are some of the references I used uh, in this, uh, this lecture. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I pronounce it well. Uh, terima kasih. Yeah. Thank you. Very well. Very well. Terima kasih.
How, how to say it in French, Mr. Ivan? In French, we say merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci? Merci. Merci, yeah. I know in Chinese, it's like xie xie. <laughs> Yeah, I have some friends in, in, in Australia when I was studying at Monash. So thank you very oh, much, great. Mr. Ivan, for the very insightful presentation, I could say, about the current issues in translation studies, starting from the introduction to translation, also translation studies in the first several slides of the presentation, and finally concluded with a very comprehensive presentations about the uh, challenges possessed by the existing um, AI or say AT um, in the translator world or the translation field. So without further ado, I think that I will directly open the question and answer session. And we already have two questions from one single uh, participant on the chat box, Mr. Ivan. I will help you to read the question. This is from okay. um, Ms. Istikoma. Uh, I hope you can hear my voice clearly. Um, yeah. This explanation is intriguing. Would, would it be acceptable if I pose a couple of questions? First question, in what ways does CAT contribute to the improvement of our translation skills? And second question, what are your thoughts on the field of translation education or translation pedagogy? Thank you very much. And Mr. Ivan. Okay. Good. I think that's uh, uh, quite interesting. These are interesting questions. Okay, the first the first one. In what way does uh, CAT contribute to the improvement of translation skills? Okay, um, I might have not mentioned this um, during my lecture, but um, uh, yeah, I think I did so, but I did not go into de details. So translation uh, as an activity, uh, yeah, has to be a translator. Okay, I'll put it different. To be a translator, you need to have a couple of of um, skills or competences, right? The first competence of a translator is his uh, linguistic competence, his linguistic skills. So to be a translator, the first thing you need to do is to be able to speak at least two languages and master, not just speaking them, but mastering them, All right? That's the first linguist, uh, the first skill. The second skill you need to have as a translator is um, cultural competency. You need to master the cultures of both uh, of the cultures, uh, the cultures from which you translate and the culture into which you are translating. And there is also another type of uh, um, skill that usually we say, uh, we call, um, the, the appropriate word doesn't come to me right now, but it's just a kind of um, extra linguistic, yeah, extra linguistic and cultural skills which means that what you know apart from the languages you are translating, right? And the last one, uh, where CAT tools will now have their impact is the technical. So as a translator, you know the languages, you know the cultures, you have some cultural background of, uh, of the languages and cultures you are translating in but now to to uh, make your translation effective and also and to also improve your pace of translation because as a translator you have a certain amount of words that you must translate per day right uh, depending on the the workload so imagine that you now have a translation of a book that is around 100 pages you can't, you won't be able to translate these uh, word after word, right? So what you do is that when you start doing your translation, for example, with SDL Trados, you will create a memory. You will create a memory. And by creating mem that memory, 
you will be putting all the expressions that you are translating. You'll create uh, any expression that you translate will go inside that memory, which means that, for example, if you're translating uh, merci beaucoup, right, which is uh, terima kasi. When you translate terima kasi, the next time in the same text that you encounter terima kasi, your CAT2 will suggest thank you, for example, or merci beaucoup in French. So you don't don't need to translate that again. So you will just click on it and continue, which means that you will be gaining in time, right? You gain in time and uh, and speed, mean, meaning that you can achieve a good translation within a limited period of time. And uh, uh, yeah, that's my answer to the first question. Then the second question, what are my thoughts on the field nation education and our translation pedagogy. Okay, my thought is that translation education should be um, revised, right? Most, most translation uh, teachers right now do not encourage their students to use uh, CAT tools, probably for the reasons that I mentioned at the end of my lecture. But I think that we should make uh we should look towards an hybrid hybrid um uh hybrid way of teaching translation, which means using CAT tools or machine translation and the traditional and the traditional ways of teaching translation. In this way, our students in translation will be competitive on the market, right? Because the new illiterates of the world right now are not those who did not do, go to school or those who cannot speak or write, right? The new illiterates are those who do not master the AI tools, right? So by combining AI tools with traditional translation teaching or pedagogy, we can improve our translation programs and our translation curriculum. I don't know if I answered the question. Yep, I hope it answers the questions, yes. uh, Ms. Lily. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes, thank you. Great, the great answer. Uh, one more, one more, please. Uh, what okay. do you think about the translation pedagogy? Uh, does the translation pedagogy is a part of uh, applied translation, a part of applied translation? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, according to me, translation pedagogy is quite similar to translation uh, education. Uh, yeah, it's a part of translation, but I think in translation pedagogy, we can say it's a kind of application of all the other translation research uh, that have been done previously. For example, I mentioned area restricted translation or medium restricted translation. So when we have all these translation uh, uh, studies done, then we can apply, right? So it's it's up just applying the researches that have been done within the area of translation studies. Thank you very Thank much you. for your question and also You're your welcome. question. Thank you very much. Ms. Lirik, yep. Yeah. So the next question is from uh, Ms. Marshanda. Hi, thank you for the new insights into the current issues in translation. My question is, do you have any advice for people looking to pursue career in translation? Especially in this era where machines and AI beginning to replace human work. Okay, yeah, that's good too, because as a translator, I also, I currently ask myself this question, right? So, um, what should I advise myself, right? <laughs> to, for the, as, as somebody who wants to remain a translator. So, to people looking to pursue a career in translation, especially in this era, uh, where trans uh, machines and AI are beginning to 
to replace human work is to move towards what I mentioned a uh, few minutes ago, to move towards post-editing. Because if there is something that right now, at the moment, that um, AI cannot do is to adapt a translation to its cultural background. That is something that AI right now does not do. So I would advise anyone who wants to uh, um, embrace the translation field to also shift because we should not be uh, we should not be adamant, right? We should not just be say, oh, I want to be a translator, so I want to translate. No, we should also look at what is happening in the field and what is happening is that AI can perform. Very good translation. So what can we do now is to pick from what the AI cannot do, right? And what I mentioned are some of the things that AI cannot do. Cultural thing, because to, to do cultural adjustments, you need to perfectly understand the culture, right? You need to perfectly understand the culture. So that will be my advice. Shifting. Uh, shifting from probably a uh, translation as a traditional activity to post editing, right? Post editing, proofreading. Yeah. And also, uh, probably not being a translator per se, but see how you can also design some, um, some, uh, softwares that can, uh, be applied in translation learning, right? So that would be my advice. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank, yeah, thank, thank you for the answers. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for the question as well. All right. <laughs> Never ending thank you from the participants. So I think we still have um another question from uh wait, let me double check it again. Uh, from Mr. Firman, Firman Shah, from the material that have that have been explained. So, how do we know that our translations are really good? Is there any standard for it? Wow, <laughs> this is quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, saying that there's a standard. Um, there's no really, there's no real standard translation. And that is what is also interesting about translation is that you and I can have different translations, but we have good translations. So there's no standard translation, but there could be translations that are more appropriate than others. So I will, I think I will repeat myself again. So um, there's no way for you to, to really know uh, how if your translation is good, uh, if you do not probably have feedbacks from either okay to know, I think that's what the person wants to know. I, I will give that. I will give you some tips to know that your translation is good, is really good. You can make it. Uh, you can make uh, give your your translation to an expert in the field to revise. Right, there are senior translators. For example, their job now is not to is no longer to translate like uh junior or or people with a, a few years of experience uh do. So they they are they are senior translators that uh, that will only revise your your review your translations. Right. So if you are not certain that your translation is good. You give your translation to someone in the field. Uh, if you are a professional translator, for example, you can give and pay, right? They are usually uh, uh, they, they they sell these services, and you need to buy. You need to pay for your services, so you pay. Or if it's a good friend of yours or someone you know very well, you give your translation. Then they will rate your translation with comments, right? And then from their feedback, you can improve your translation. I think that's the easiest way to translate. Then after translating, uh, imagine that probably you did not use uh, AI, right? You translated yourself. You might also want to use AI 
and see, for example, where you made some grammatical mistakes, some vocabulary mistake, and still after AI, after the AI gives you uh, suggestions, you still have to go through them again. And the last way of doing uh, if uh, a translation is good is by having the feedbacks of the reader, which might be the last result, because when the if the if the readers are not satisfied, then there's nothing you can do at that particular time. So the easiest way is to give to someone in the field to translate for you to uh, re uh, review for you. Yep, thank you very much. I hope that answer Mr. Firman Shah questions. All right. Um, we still have some time for the question and answer session, but I actually have one question that I'm eager to ask to Mr. Ivan, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, because I read according to your CV that you speak three languages uh, in the professional level, like French, English, and Chinese. My question is how those language position themselves into your translation competence? Like, do they stand as a contribute or um, otherwise as a barrier? Because if we look back to it, they have like three different uh, cultural um, understandings as well, like French, English, and Chinese. They have like three different uh, cultures. So how do you see those uh, language is competence or repertoire into your translation. Mm, uh, can you rephrase? I'm not sure I got your question. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm sorry for that. So my question is about your competence. No, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I saw from your CV that you can speak three languages, mm -hmm. French, English, yeah. and Chinese. Uh, my question is how those three languages stand uh, into your uh, translation um, professions? Like, do they contribute to each other or do they like stand as a barrier because it, it has or it possesses like different culture behind it, behind it? So like based on your experience, how do you see those uh, languages competence? Okay, um, I would say, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I would say they have different, they have different, uh, I think they, they offer me different benefits. They offer me different benefits in the sense that um, they make me understand a lot of things. Because, for example, I am a French speaker, right? French is actually even my first language before English. So, um. As a French speaker and the exposure that I had uh, to the French world or to the Francophone world, it makes me understand how things are done. Not probably, I'm not having a uh, an in-depth uh, understanding, but it makes me have a, um, let's say, a quite superficial understanding of what happens in France, in Belgium, in a little bit in Canada, Canada, especially Quebec, which is a, uh, the, the French spoken area of Canada, and many other French speaking countries, other, um, other African speaking countries, such as Mali, Togo, Benin, and yeah, and so on. So, we, we, having speaking those languages uh, gives me an exposure to these languages and these cultures, right? Then, English, same. Right, because English is a language, but if we go into the cultural matter, we would see that English in the UK context is different than English in the Australian context where you are. I think Monash University is in Australia, right? Yeah. yeah so it, yeah. So it's different from uh, English in Australia. Uh, different from English in Ghana. In Cameroon even, yeah, because Cameroon is a bilingual country. We also have English as uh, official language. So it also gives me an exposure to these uh, cultures. And uh, Chinese, Chinese will give me a good exposure to the Chinese culture. And the good thing is also that I am doing Chinese at the academic level. So there are a lot of things I can understand. And it helps me a lot in my translations. It helps me a lot of us in my translation, but 
If there's something I can say is that when I translate from Chinese, I usually, if Chinese language is, sub, is supposed to be involved, I will rather prefer to translate from Chinese to French and from Chinese into English. Why? Because although I have a good understanding of Chinese language and culture, I am sure that till up to now, probably with improvement, it will change. But up to now, I'm not able to translate from to translate properly from English or French into Chinese. Not because I have a bad Chinese level, but Chinese has this thing which is quite impressive. Academic language is completely different. And Chinese is a highly metaphorical language. And it will look a, a metaphorical, it will look a lot uh, too metaphorical to us, but to Chinese, it's something normal, right? So Chinese will use metaphors like, uh, like um, they are just speaking normally. Yeah. Right? So with meaning that if I translate from English into Chinese, into a very casual language style, they will notice, they will be able to notice that this is not a good translation, mm. right? So usually from English or French into Chinese, I do simple translations, right? Like technical translation that you, I only need to have the terminology of, um, Chinese and probably French, then I can do it. Like recently, I did um, a translation from French into Chinese of um, a criminal record, right? It's easy, right? Because these terms, are <laughs> they already have their equivalents uh, in Chinese. So I just do uh, this uh, equivalence matching and add the right grammar and that's it. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it covers um, a lot. Um, my question. Uh, so before I think before we proceed to the end of the session, uh, we still have one last question, uh, from okay. our student here on the chat box. Um, I'll help you to read it. Uh, okay. Hello, sir. That's a great topic to discuss. However, is there any specific issues that you can suggest to us as beginners or as students not studying translation in particular? Uh, can you come again? Sorry, I, I'm afraid I did not uh, listen to the end. Yeah, end so the question. question the question is, is there any specific issues that you can suggest to us as beginners or as students not studying translations in particular? Okay, uh, is there any uh, specific issues that I can suggest to us beginners or as students not studying translation? Okay, so I guess um, the person wants to have uh, just you know, some encouraging words, right? Encouraging words, maybe to learn the language or uh, achieve other things. Okay, so my advice. And what I usually tell my students is that no matter whether, no matter if you are doing um, translation or not, the first quality of someone who would like to make it in life is to be curious. And I think as a translator, curiosity helps me a lot. So if there's something I, I suggest is to be curious and curious, in the positive way, which means that um, watching news, right? Watching news, you should be aware of what's going on in the world. Right? You should be aware of what's going on in the world. Then, if you are an English uh, student, you um, you have you can probably listen to some important talk shows in uh, reliable platforms. In your country, I may not know those platforms, but I'm sure they are reliable platforms in your country or other platforms like BBC, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, CNN, Fox News. 
here is not, I'm not asking you to go, it's not only about, uh, it's not only for the news, but just to get familiar with the types of expressions they use, right? Because I know that these news, when we talk about media, the media are very manipulative. So I'm not talking about what is said, right? It's mostly about how it's said. Yeah, how it's said. What are the types of expressions they use? What are the topics they they they, they discuss about? Then, uh, still, no matter if you want to be a translator or not, I will encourage you also to learn languages. Learn languages. For me, for example, China or Chinese, I would say Chinese has opened so many doors to me. The simple fact that I speak Chinese has opened so many doors for me. So learning languages is also opening yourself to a new world. By learning French, like I just said, you open yourself to France, Belgium, um, Gabon, many other countries, right? By learning uh, Russian, you open yourself uh, to Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, because although these countries have their own languages, they also speak Russian. Right. And also, you have to follow what is currently happening in the world. Right. That's why I mentioned Russian. We see how things are shifting in the world, how Russia is taking over many countries in the world. Right. So, learning languages will position yourself to also get your share of what is happening in the world right now. So um, yeah, that's what I can suggest for those for the beginners, right? Curiosity, hard work, and uh, learning languages. I think for now that should be good for you, right? Then later on, if we still have opportunity, I can add more suggestions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ivan, for the presentation. Um, also for answering all the questions from our participants, I could say their enthusiasm, raising some like diverse questions uh, to you. So uh, I think that's the end of uh, Mr. Ivan's presentations um, and also our main session. Uh, I wouldn't only say that it is knowledgeable, but also it's a very eye-opening uh, presentation and discussions about translation studies. It helps us to understand translations, not only as a concept or as an activity, but also as a prominent study or a field of uh, study in the educations, because uh, Mr. Evan also helps to break down several types of translations. Um, for example, descriptive translation studies, partial, and all also apply translation studies, which I believe um, can be also uh, a source for our participants to do like research, for example, in the future or to do uh, more explorations. So for me personally, it helps me to realize that translations actually take a very big role in our life. So it's not only like simply translating from the source language to target language, but also it helps us to dive deep into the historical, into the cultures, or also even to the psychological conditions or what's on the mind of the translator, as Mr. Ivan said. Also on the part where Mr. Ivan, uh, Ivan engaged with many examples or relatable examples, I could say such as like bringing examples about Quran or Bible, Israel and Palestinian conflicts. I think that part also helped us to understand the concepts uh, in detail or like it gives the portrayal into the concepts in translation studies like more clearly to us participants. Um, yeah, uh, also uh, the ideas about, uh, it helps us to understand that translation, even though it sounds like very simple, but it's 
also actually rigorous and require high cognitive efforts, as Mr. Ivan uh, said previously to some extent. So we need to be like very mindful as well when we are interacting in this field. And lastly, about the uh, existence of computer aided translations or CAT or machine translation, um, I I, I catch some points that we as a teacher, especially, we shouldn't uh, actually uh, encourage our students to use this uh, machine technology because it can uh, hampers our linguistic competence. Also, it has ideas, uh, it has correlations with the ethical considerations for us acad academicians. And also lastly, it can hamper our critical thinking and problem solving skills. So it's very comprehensive and knowledgeable discussions. Mr. Ivan, thank you very much once again from us, uh, the English Education Department of Amada <laughs> University. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, before closing the sessions and also handing the session to the MC, there will be a, a handing of a certificate from Mr. Suchipto from the English the, the English Education Department. So please, Mr. Suchipto. Okay, uh, uh, before that, uh, let me just say a quick one, sorry. Uh, I would just say thank you for, thank you to all the students and teachers that attended this lecture. Uh, I will say it's it was a pleasure sharing with you. For me, I'm always happy when it comes to sharing knowledge. So um, uh, yeah, thank you for attending. Ending and yeah, uh, hopefully we shall meet in another discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I... Yes, Pajipno. Well, thank you very much, Maika Suciwati. Dear Mr. Ivan. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ivan, for the fruitful sharing. Yeah? That was a great lecture. It will be very uh, beneficial for us and all audiences here. On behalf of English Education Study Program, we would like to present a certificate to you. Please help me, the uh, committee. Would you like to share the certificate? Can you show the certificate? No? Okay, that's why. Well, to Mr. Ifan, again, we express our gratitude yeah, uh, on behalf of English Education Study Program, Universitas Amadalan. Hopefully, we can meet again in another occasion. We can maybe we can uh, do uh, other cooperation, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, we can invite you again, or maybe sometime uh, the next time you can uh, visit our university in Indonesia <laughs> one day. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will send to you uh, through email yeah, this certificate. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll be glad. I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to come to Indonesia one day and definitely. Definitely, if I'm in Indonesia, I will come by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's. Uh, how about we we give uh give applause to our speaker? Please give your reaction. Thank you so much. And the faces on the classroom as well, Mr. Ivan, where the international class as well are attending. Wow. Oh, okay. Great, great. Hi to everyone. Resrika from Yogyakarta. Oh, hello, Mari Pai. Hello, hi everyone. Wow, I could also hello, see hello you everyone. Start scoping. See your seniors. You your juniors. Watching you as the model. 
much. Thank you very much, Pari Pai. Also, uh, Mr. Sucipto and also Mr. Ivan. So maybe you forgot to see the participants. Um, actually, we have more than 100 and two. Uh, 100 something participants watching this um lecture with us mr ivan and it doesn't count it doesn't include our participants on youtube streaming as well so <laughs> thank you very much for everyone for attending wow. maybe give applause and shout out for yourself thank you um yeah i thank think you, that's thank all. you so much i think that's all uh and i will hand it over to the master of ceremony Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Ivan and Ms. Ika. That was an interesting topic, clear explanation, and the new insight for us. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to our last agenda today. I am Sanya, representing all of the committees. would like to say thank you so much for your participation and sorry for all of the mistakes and i hope this webinar will be useful for all of you and let's close our event today by reciting hamdalah to get alamin. and see you in the next international guest lecture that will be held on 23rd of october 2023 and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Thank you so much, everyone. Hi, Sanya. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Think a quick uh, screenshot before that, Mr. Ivan. Yeah. Maybe the okay. comment. Okay, sure. For taking some screenshots. Okay, everyone, turn your camera on. Panitia, tolong dibantu ya. Terima kasih. Fik, hitung Afik atau Aulia. Oke, okay, guys. Uh, one, two, three. Oke, okay, once more. One, two, three. Uh, the second page one two three the second flight i mean sorry one two three okay thank you guys all right thank you very much thank you thank everyone. everyone thank you thank you hi miss thank you so much thank you so much hi julius and christopher hello thank you very much i miss you all i miss you too yeah <laughs> See you, see you, see you again on 23. Thank you, sir. Bye. Matur noon, everyone. Matur <laughs> noon oh, in Japanese. Hati hati. Okay. Okay, see you. Terima kasih. See you. Yes.